Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for the ceremonial bill signing, or actual bill signing. We want to thank you for making time to come today, and hopefully everyone is accommodated space-wise. Please feel free to use the furniture and take a seat. My name is Ali Isom. I'm Deputy Chief of Staff and Communications Director for Governor Herbert. I'll do a quick run of show so that for members of the media, you know in what order to anticipate our speakers to stay. Uh, before I do that, though, I'd like to welcome our many dignitaries and VIPs who have joined us as well. We have several members of the legislature here, including Representative LeVar Christensen, Representative Jim Nielsen, Representative Lee Perry, Senator Wayne Niederhauser, uh, we have Bill Red and Bill Howell, the famous Bills, have joined us. Representative Paul Ray, Representative Steve Handy. We have Stan Rasmussen with the Sutherland Institute, Representative Hendrickson, Representative Sumption, Representative Clark, Representative Herod, Randy Parker with the Utah Farm Bureau, Margaret Bird with the CITLA, Mike Swenson with the Shared Access Alliance, and our members of the federal delegation who have joined us as well as the bill sponsors. Our run of show will be Governor Herbert will first do a welcome. He will be followed by Senator Hatch, who will be followed by Senator Lee. Then we will hear from Congressman Bishop, then Representative Ivory, and Representative Barris. Governor Herbert will then um, provide a closing remarks and he will sign the bill. For members of the media, we won't be doing question and answer in this room, but we will make members of the program today, as well as other dignitaries who you might have an interest in speaking with, available to you in the, out, just outside these doors in the rotunda, just out of courtesy. We have quite a few bodies in here and to avoid congestion. We'll take those interviews outside the room. So, Governor Herbert. Thank you, Ali, and thanks to all of you for being here. We appreciate members of the press and the media here. You can see by the uh, attendance here today that there's a lot of interest in this issue. Uh, there's emotion on it. Uh, there's uh, concern. And uh, we're here today because we believe that the federal government has failed to keep its promises to the state of Utah. And it's time for us to do something about that that will help us uh, for economic development and particularly to help us with the education of our children. Uh, in 1894, and we have a couple of real scholars here, and Bill Red and Bill Howell, who've been involved with this issue for many, many years. Uh, but in 1894, as part of our Enabling Act, the promise made to Utah was the same promise made to virtually every other state in America. That was those lands which were not privately owned at the time a state would, would be disposed of. And the disposed mean to, to sell them, to give them, but to privatize those lands and do so in an expeditious manner. Because that didn't happen. Two-thirds of uh, Utah's land mass is controlled and owned by the federal government. And I'm here to tell you, it's not just a Utah problem, it's a Western state problem. As you look around and look at a map of the United States of America, you'll find that 90% of our federal lands are in uh, the Western states. In seven western states, the federal lands comprise more than 50% of their total land mass, putting us at distinct disadvantage. And we have to, as a state, live by the reality of control by distant uh, Congress, who does not understand all that has to go on in our own backyards here, because they are so distant, and managed by unelected uh, federal administrators who sometimes don't care. Uh, what uh, the challenges are for the state that these federal lands reside with, within. Our royal royalties, our severance taxes, our ability to develop economically, our resource extraction, responsible use of these lands that can be done uh, in an economically uh, sound way are cur curtailed, often arbitrarily curtailed, to our detriment. And what it means to me as the governor of the state of Utah is that Robert Abbey the director of the BLM, has more control over the land in Utah than the governor of the state of Utah. Uh, the bill I'm signing today, House Bill 148, sponsored by Representative Ken, Sumption, or Ken Ivory. Ken Sumption wishes he'd sponsored it. <laughs> House Bill 148, sponsored by Representative Ken Ivory, established, a, establishes a principle-based framework uh, for structured and civil public discourse 
as we uh, look uh, forward to opportunities to improve the paradigm that we have here with our relationship with the federal government. It has a potential legal challenge, but it's a pathway forward for us to rebalance our relationship with the federal government. Uh, I believe the state of Utah must, in fact, restore some kind of semblance and balance so that we're on a similar kind of equal footing with other states in America, particularly those east of the Rocky Mountains. If we don't do so, we will not have the opportunity nor the ability to have educational parity, uh, which we certainly need here in Utah and with a fast-growing state like we have with a high birth rate and a large family size, uh, the education of our students has got to be uh, paramount on our minds. Now, we don't have all the answers. Uh, there needs to be a lot more discussion and questions that need to be asked. But this bill will, in fact, formalize and legitimize the engagement that we will need to have for our policymakers, particularly those back in Washington, D.C., to move this conversation forward. This bill is the mechanism to put the federal government on notice that we want to have increased dialogue. We've tried in times past with some uh, forms of legislation which have been rebuffed and ignored and seemingly uh, uh, given just a lack of consideration. So this puts the federal government on notice uh, as a way to help leverage and get their attention for en enhanced federal dialogue. It's an apparatus to facilitate a paradigm change when it comes to the public land management and the justification for conducting a complete and thorough economic analysis of the, of the financial potential of the lands in question. With that, I'd like to thank uh, Representative Ken Ivory, Senator Wayne Niederhauser, and Representative Roger Barris, the sponsors of a companion bill on House Joint Resolution 3, for leading the charge and understanding the importance of this issue and, and uh, helping get their colleagues in the legislature on board. I also want to recognize and thank uh, the Attorney General, Mark Shurtleff, who can't be here, but his Chief Deputy, uh, Attorney General John Swallow, and his staff for their counsel and advice as this legislation has made its way through the, through the legislature and to my desk. I'd also like to recognize and acknowledge our congressional delegation. This is really going to be put a burden on them to see what they can do in Washington, D.C. to change the dialogue and, uh, and uh, move the balance uh, uh, for where we are now to where we ought to be in conjunction with other states. But I appreciate Senator Hatch, our senior senator, who's been leading this fight for many, many years, and this is a continuation of that effort. I want to recognize Congressman Rob Bishop, who's been a tireless advocate, and again, has taken some arrows and some criticism because of his forthright manner, and, uh, and a leader in highlighting this uh, interrelationship between the public lands and our education. As a former teacher, he probably understands that uh, intersection better than most. He also has some great maps, and I think we'll see some of those here today. I also want to recognize Senator Mike Lee uh, for his key role in this process. It's not too long ago that uh, Senator Lee uh, came to see me and uh, said he needed some legislation passed in order to shine a spotlight on the way that Utah has been disadvantaged because of these large amounts of public lands that we have and have uh, not a lot of control over. And he needed this legislation as an issue so that his colleague, uh, to show his colleagues back in Washington. And I appreciate his early support, and that's become a catalyst for us to get to this point here today in this legislation. Uh, I'd also acknowledge Congressman Chaffetz, who's not here with us today. He has some family issues that he's taking care of uh, today. But he wanted me to convey to all of you that he is highly supportive of this effort. Uh, with that, again, uh, we want to hear from... Uh, our congressional delegation. So we'll first turn the time over to Senator Hatch, then Senator Lee, then Congressman Bishop. Well, thank you, Governor. You're a great leader, and you're doing a great job in this state. And I'm personally uh, observant of it, along with your lieutenant governor. And of course, our state legislature is one of the best in the country. Really proud of uh, these three state legislators who have done so much to carry this ball, but uh, virtually everybody in the state legislature is, is, uh, is working on this in one way or the other. I go all the way back to the Ronald Reagan days when we had to come up with the Sagebrush Rebellion because of the way the West was being treated. 
And we rocked them back on their heels. Uh, we, just didn't, we just didn't go far enough. It's just that simple. But we also had Reagan, who claimed that he was a sa sagebrush rebel as well. And it helped us get our point of view across. And we have had, uh, since then, at least some a better consideration by the federal government. But we know that two-thirds of our state is really controlled by the federal government. And a lot of those overseers really don't have what it takes to care for our state like we do. Our folks are very proud of this state. We love this state. We can take better care of it than the federal government. And we will take better care of it. But more importantly, we will be able to develop our resources in a way that our educational system will benefit greatly. Some of our counties are so federally owned that they hardly can raise any money. Every year for education, let alone other matters, every year Back there, we have to come up with uh, payments in lieu of taxes, which is a small down payment on what the federal government really does owe for demanding control over all of this land. And you know, a lot of states uh, were in our shape that uh, no longer have the federal government as overseers over every aspect of their lives. Uh, and I'll just point out one just clear-cut uh, aspect of it. Uh, North Dakota. You know, uh, the president has been bragging over the last number of months that there's more oil being developed under his administration than prior administrations. Well, there's a good answer to that. It's no thanks to his administration. It's because states like uh, North Dakota, where they found the Bakken claim, are developing their oil on private lands. Now there's a big find down in Texas again, on private lands. And they don't have to go hat in hand to the federal government and get turned down year after year after year for projects that really make sense. I can guarantee you that the people of Utah know better about how to handle our lands than any overseer back there in Washington. And that's not a knock at all of them, because some of them really are sincere and dedicated. But the fact of the matter is we live here. We understand this state. We love this state. We cherish it. We want to make it the best state in the union in every way possible, and we're, we're thwarted in that in many respects because of federal ownership of our lands. We're tired of it, and I believe we've got to all stand up. And we do it in the name of education, but we also do it in the name of preservation. We also do it in the name of developing lands where they ought to be developed. And we also do it in the name of helping our country. And Utahns are ready and prepared to do that. We have a Western State Caucus back there. I'm the uh, chairman of the Western Lands in that caucus. And I have to say that uh, we're few in number. But the fact of the matter is we've got a tougher group of uh, Western State Senators than we've had in many years. And I think we're about to get even tougher. So I'm hopeful that we can push this forward and get some people on the other side to help us back there and give us the right to run our own lands in our own way, we'll do it better, we'll make these lands more productive, and above all, we'll help our kids in ways that they are currently not being helped because of the lack of funds. I'm really proud of our governor and all of the people who are speaking to you here today, these three legislators, and I want to just compliment them for the work they're doing. God bless. I agree with and appreciate the uh, words of our senior Senator Warren Hatch, my friend and colleague. He used an appropriate image a few minutes ago when he referred to the states having to go back to Congress time and time again, hat in hand. It reminds me of a song by a Scottish rock band called The, the Proclaimers. The name of the song, interestingly enough, is Cap in Hand. And the chorus of the song contains the words, I can't understand why we let someone else rule our land. I don't know whether the Proclaimers have ever toured in Utah, but I hereby invite them to come to our state. <laughs> when we became a state over a century ago, we were given a promise, a promise that some will insist was explicit in Section 9 of the Statehood Enabling Act. Others will say was implicit, um, if not explicit. But the understanding 
based on what had happened in other states, was that eventually the federal government would no longer continue to hold all of this land in perpetuity. Now, let's all think for a minute about concerns that we might have. If any one landowner owned more than, say, 5% of the land mass in our state, it might bring up some concerns. I'm pretty sure it would, regardless of whether that owner was an individual, a corporation, a nonprofit institution, or, or something else. People might be worried about uh, the possibility that that person or entity would use its influence to keep people off of land, to keep people off of their own land, restricting ingress and egress, perhaps using the domination over the marketplace because of the massive land ownership to micromanage that state's economy. Anything that landowner did would have a pretty significant impact, an unduly large impact on that state's economy. Now all of a sudden, imagine what happens if that land ownership of that individual or corporation becomes no longer 5%, but say 10%, 20, 30, 40%. Pretty soon, it's two-thirds of the land in the state. Pretty soon, you've got a land mass that looks like the island archipelago represented in that map over there. That's the private land. And all of a sudden, that landowner says, in addition to owning all this land and controlling access to and across all other lands, uh, uh, that, that, that the landowner is declaring itself exempt from all state and local taxation. That has a huge economic impact on that state's economy. And that's exactly the scenario that we have here in Utah. This bill is a step in the right direction. This bill is a first step toward reclaiming some of what has been lost because of this. Now, I want to clarify a few things about this legislation. Number one, this bill is in no respect against public lands. We here in Utah, the three million people that call Utah our home, love our public lands. We love having access to public lands where we can recreate and do all kinds of things. This bill is not about not having public lands. It's about deciding who administers them. It's about deciding who bears the cost of them. Should Utahns have to bear the cost of this kind of ownership situation? Or should all Americans share it? If the federal government wants to own all of this land, it should be treated in many respects just like any other landowner who has to give their share and not make what they curiously call a PILT payment. Senator Hatch referred to it, the payment in lieu of taxes. If any of us wrote a check to the federal government saying, uh, I'm not going to pay what I owe under federal tax law, but I will pay you what I feel like I can pay and what I feel like paying. It's my payment in lieu of taxes, my PILT check. Well, we'd be locked up. The federal government does it to us, giving us a tiny pittance of the portion of taxes that would otherwise be going into our state's education system, toward funding state and local services that we desperately need, that Utah's residents deserve. And we continue to take it year after year. That's why I commend our legislature and our governor for having the nobility, the courage, to stand up and start a conversation that is perhaps overdue, but whose time has come. Utah's best days are yet ahead of her. This bill moves us in that direction. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I'm an old teacher, so I can't do anything without an audiovisual here. Or in this case, just a visual. First map you see here is simply the real state of Utah. The stuff that is colored in red, I hope on that map, is the private property in this state. Uh, that's all there is. That is what the state of Utah can control. Most people, when they look at that, are just amazed at how that situation exists. Now, everything in blue on this map is the percentage of each state that is owned by and controlled by the federal government. And you can see there is a wide disproportion. Even though the federal government now controls one out of every three acres, it's almost all, it's almost all congested here in the West. And if I were to hold up the other, other chart, which tells you, tells you the states in red are the ones that have the hardest time funding their education system, and you look at the red here and the blue over there, you'll see there is an amazing correlation between the two of these. States with a high amount of public property have a difficult time funding their education system. Now, to be honest, um, there, this is a time 
in which this kind of argument can now be made. Because a lot of my friends who serve in Congress back east, they look at this map and they'll go, wow, I didn't understand, I didn't realize, and basically they don't care. Sovereignty arguments, fairness arguments, they don't care about. But when you start talking about how this impacts kids, they all have kids and they care about it. When I remind them that they're paying $8 billion a year to maintain the control of the West and hurt our kids, all of a sudden they care about it. In fact, I think it's about time to start another Occupy movement, like an <laughs> Occupy BLM, because 99% of all the revenues that are generated on federal land and by federal projects in the United States comes from 1% of the land. And most of that land is not in Utah. It's actually most of it is off, off the coast. Utah could be generating a whole lot of revenues that would go to help pay our infrastructure and help pay our kids and our education system if they were simply allowed to do it by the federal government. And that is why I am so grateful of what the legislature is doing here. What the legislature is basically saying is look at the map. Massachusetts occupies Massachusetts. Maine occupies Maine. It's about time we allowed Nevada to occupy Nevada and Utah to occupy Utah and to receive the benefits of the, of the resources that happen to be there. And more importantly, to do it intelligently. They're not going to strip mine everything because you don't have resources everywhere. But if the state of Utah is now willing to meet together and come up with a matrix of how you actually can preserve land by the state, and states have the equal ability to do that as the federal government does, and how you maintain access for recreation purposes, which, which the government in Washington is slowly closing down in the West, so that people do have the ability of hunt and fishing and recreating on public lands and develop the resources that are there so the state can not only get property taxes but they can also get income taxes from high paying jobs as well as royalties payments and, 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 uh, and, and severance taxes at the same time, then, they, then there is something the state of Utah is willing to stand up and say to the federal government, look, we are ready to take responsibility for the state of Utah. I think there is time for a paradigm shift, which happens every 40 to 50 years back in Washington, to say now is the time to change the way we manage public lands in the West. The West is ready. The West needs it. It is now time to, do, to change the way we have done things traditionally, because what we have done traditionally flat out does not work. It hurts our kids. And I'm proud of this legislature for stepping up. I'm proud of the governor for being willing to sign this resolution and bill today. And we, are, we, are, we pledge back in Washington to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes, to try and move this issue forward and to help the state of Utah and to help our kids. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Representative Ken Ivory. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm so grateful for our governor for taking leadership on this, grateful for our congressional delegation, and truly we stand on the shoulders of giants. We, this has been a team effort. This is what Team Utah looks like. This has been an effort through our Attorney General's office, through our Governor's office, our CITLA lands, our, our community organizations, our education organizations, um, our legislature. So many people have been involved in, in, in what is happening here as a Team U, Utah effort. Now let's talk about a tale of two states. You've got North Dakota, if you see on there, the tiny little square, and then you've got Utah. They came into the Union at about the same time. 1879, 1884, North Dakota and Utah. The terms of their statehood with respect to disposing the land, transferring title to the public lands, virtually word for word identical. And yet the federal government controls 3% of the land in North Dakota, 65% of the land in Utah. North Dakota just added $3,700 per pupil above the national average in per pupil funding. Utah, coincidentally, is $3,700 below the national average in per pupil funding. To catch up to North Dakota on a per pupil spending basis would take $4 billion. To get to average would take $2 billion. Think about that. It would take $2 billion just to get to average. So why now? Congressman Bishop mentioned a little bit about why now. $2 billion to get to average. Some people have said, well, let's just tax our way out. Let's try harder. Well, guess what? To tax our way out, we'd have to more than double the income tax. 
killing our economy like Illinois and California has found out. Or we could increase the corporate tax by more than 900% and drive all of our companies out of the state under the guise of increasing funding to education and taking care of our public services. Now, in addition to the $2 billion education funding gap, we have $5 billion of our $13 billion budget that is federal funds from a fiscally unsustainable federal government. Everyone's been telling us it's not a matter of if, it's only when and how soon that funding begins to diminish to our state. Why now? Also, why now, three years ago, the United States Supreme Court unanimously declared that Congress cannot diminish, and this is, this is their words, the uniquely sovereign character of a state's admission into the Union. And they said this applies particularly so where virtually all of a state's public lands are at stake. Congress can't diminish the uniquely sovereign character of our admission as a state. Why now? We've got Supreme Court authority. Just this week, the, the, the Supreme Court unanimously decided a case, the Sackett case, and said it's unthinkable that the federal government could use strong-arm tactics over private property. It's unthinkable. We agree. We agree. It's unthinkable that our children are $2 billion below average in per-pupil funding. It's unthinkable that we're dependent, dangerously dependent, $5 billion of our $13 billion budget on a fiscally irresponsible federal government. We agree. It's unthinkable. So, what if we don't? What if we don't? People have said it's hard. Sure, it's hard. What if we don't? Our, our good Senator Lee, early on in this effort, he was so helpful in, in, in the legal analysis as we were working on this early on. He said, we'll stand to account. If the promises are the same, and they are, only the performance is different, we'll stand to account for our children, for leaving that on the table. We'll stand to account in the future of our state in, in social services and taking care of our poor, taking care of our sick, taking care of our roads, educating our children. We'll stand to account if we're unwilling to stand up now because it might be hard. Promises are the same, only the performance is different. So now, this is just the beginning of what Team Utah looks like. This is the beginning of what Team Utah looks like. It's time for us to stand as the model to the Western states and the model to the nation of what it means to be self-reliant and free. This is not just a Utah matter. Certainly this will unleash, un unleash employment and increase our, our, our economic activity in Utah, but this is also a national matter. This unleashes employment in the nation. This solves debt and deficit issues nationally if we unleash the resources responsibly. This is not just a, just a matter of chest thumping in Utah. This is a matter of providing for the education of our children and the long-term self-reliance of our state. So this is the beginning of what Team Utah looks like. This is the beginning to be the model to the Western states and to the United States of what it means to be self-reliant and free. We passed out a little card, and on that card you've got a link to a Facebook page and a link to a website. We're going to keep adding more and more resources so that you can get up to speed on, on, on what and why this is important, what it means, what the background is. We've had so many people helping to research and helping to put together these, these materials. Share them with your friends. Like the Facebook page. Go to the website. Check back often as we continue to build the education as we learn to teach others and be that model. Thank you so much for being involved. This is our time. This is our time as Utah because Utah leads the way. That's what we do. Utah leads the way, and it's time for us to move forward. Thank you so very much. Lime Representative Roger Barris, you can all breathe a sigh of relief. Other than the governor's concluding remarks, I'm the last one to speak. You know, I wanted to frame my remarks today, uh, first of all, by, again, thanking all of you who are here. And uh, uh, as Representative Ivory said, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. There are many who have come before us, and uh, we are trying to complete the work which has come before us. We appreciate our, appreciate our federal delegation for their, their willingness to engage in this, and, uh, because they feel the same way that we do. They, they are Utahns as well. There is something, though, that's been on my mind recently that uh, I just wanted to talk about briefly, and that's some of the rhetoric that I hear from time to time from those who say, well, Utahns can't manage that land, or you're just going to get it and sell it off to your corporate cronies. You know, nothing could be far further from the truth. In fact, 
Uh, I, I want to know the last time that you ever heard that the words <clears throat> of the federal government and good management were used together. <laughs> and, and so Utah definitely has a track record in which we have good management practices and uh, we are certainly up to the challenge of governing our, our, our public lands. Let me tell you a couple of other things why I'm concerned. We've heard today about the importance of the state of Utah having the ability, the freedom, uh, the sovereignty to chart its own, own course, the ability to uh, pay for the education of our children and our, our economy and our citizens. But you know, there's some other things that I'm quite concerned about. Frankly, I'm worried about the way the federal government is managing the states or the, the public lands in our states. You know, federal lands are under a different regulatory scheme than private lands and state lands. They, are, they have a heavily burdened bureaucracy and regulatory scheme that uh, they have to go through whenever anything is done. And because of that, these are some of the things that I'm worried about. I'm worried about the increasing restrictions of access to our lands for recreation and for tourism. I'm worried about the closure of roads when federal authorities stand there at those roads with signs and say you can no longer go to places where Utahns and our visitors from around the nation have gone for decades. I'm worried about the infestation of invasive species, plant species, that are decimating our agricultural lands and our watersheds. And I'm worried about our languishing, languishing forests and that have fallen victim to catastrophic, catastrophic fires and beetle infestation. I'm worried about the increasing restrictions on the ability to use the natural resources for which, uh, in which our state has been blessed that will not only feed our families but fuel our economy. And I really am worried about the impact that the federal debt will have on the future of public lands. The out of control spending of our federal government and the increasing federal debt, there is going to be fewer and fewer dollars that will be available to maintain and manage these public lands. Now Utah, let's think of Utah. We are considered the best managed state in the nation. We still have a AAA bond rating. I think that's a little better than the federal government. We also are considered one of the best places in the country to grow a business, to raise a family. Think about in 2002 when Utah welcomed the world to the Olympics and how successful that was because of the way that Utahns came together and helped to manage and, and have such a, a great Olympic event. And finally, Utah has a regulatory structure already in place with which we regulate and manage our state public lands and our school and institutional trust lands. It's a very successful um, uh, uh, management process and uh, it has a proven track record. So why would not Utah be very capable, in fact more capable than our federal landlord in managing these lands that we love, that we treasure? And that is why, that is one of the reasons that we are taking the initiative as the state of Utah to manage these lands and we're up to the challenge and uh, we are looking forward to this conversation that we're going to have with the federal uh, government in making that transfer of title and management to these lands. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to all of you for being here and, and thanks to our speakers and those who have given us, I think, some good rational thought on this public land debate. This is the beginning, this is certainly not the end of it, and, uh, but it's something that we need to, in fact, continue on with. Let me just uh, summarize by saying that uh, private land ownership has been the cornerstone for freedom in this country and economic opportunity. It's one of the blessings we've had as a country when we came here and had the, for the first time in a, in a univer universal way, the ability to own our own land. And loss of that ownership, in fact, uh, takes away freedom and liberty to the, to the public and the people. Uh, federal control of our public lands has put us at a distinct disadvantage compared to other states. The example has been given of North Dakota, which I think is a stark comparison to what happens when the federal government actually did dispose of the land and uh, what they did in North Dakota and what has not happened here with a lack of disposition of the land. 
As our population continues to grow as a fast-growing state, that uh, uh, disadvantage becomes more and more a stark reality. It's like a farmer who has a piece of land that 70% uh, uh, of it's taken out of production. And that's maybe okay, we can get by as the family is small, but as the family continues to grow and grow and multiply, it becomes increasingly more difficult to have economic opportunity if some of the land's taken out of production. That's what's happened to Utah. And for us today, the, the big issue, I think, for a lot of us, it's a common discussion in political circles. How are we going to fund our education? We have a fast-growing state with a lot of students. How are we going to fund it? It's been mentioned that we're $2.2 .2 billion short of the national average. Um, it's easy for some to say, well, just raise taxes. But in order to do that, you'd have to double uh, our income tax rate in order to raise that kind of revenue. And in doing so, uh, it would devastate our economy. It would certainly destroy family budgets. And in fact, we'd go from being the best place in America to do business to the worst place in America to do business. So that's not an answer. That's just political rhetoric. Uh, this is a, uh, something with some substance. We, all, I think, all recognize that the status quo, for whatever reason we've gotten to this point, is not sustainable and ought to be changed and modified. Um, I'm compelled to sign this legislation today because the status quo is not acceptable. There needs to be the opportunity for Utah to come in and have some balance in the management of our public and private lands and be on the same kind of equal footing that other states in America are on, again, for our uh, economic opportunities and particularly if we're going to be able to fund education. I think, as Congressman Bishop pointed out, it's not a coincidence that 10 out of the 12 public land states are below the national average when it comes to public education funding. So with that, this is the first step of a long journey. It's not going to be easy. Uh, it's going to be, in fact, difficult. We have uh, some education to do and some awareness. This legislation will help us shed that uh, light on this discussion and hopefully bring some rational thought to the process. In that process, I'm going to invite all Western states to participate. That means Democrats as well as Republicans working together to see if we cannot find the appropriate balance when it comes to the management of public lands that will give us uh, an optimized effort to grow economically and to fund education. Uh, it's a difficult fight. This is the first step, but I'm here to tell you it's a fight worth having. So with that, uh, we'll adjourn to the table. I'll sign the legislation. We thank you for your attendance. We'll invite the, our uh, dignitaries to come. <laughs>